Silva, Denise Borges, and Jose Luis da Silva. First, I'd like to thank uh, today's webinar, our webinar sponsors, the Uso American Education Foundation and the North American Portuguese Teachers Association. Uh, these sponsors help make uh, these webinars uh, possible because this uh, webinar system is not free, so we very much appreciate their support and so encourage everybody to visit their websites and uh, patronize these organizations. Again, this, everybody is in listen-only mode, um, so if you are speaking and no one's answering, that's why. If you do have a question or a comment, you can use the GoToWebinar go to console on the uh, right side of your screen, and we will be saving all questions for the end of the webinar. This is just a little bit about our speakers. As you can see, we have a, a, a wide variety of, um, of experience here, and, and they're all eager to share their information about um, Portuguese language programs here in the U.S. and um, how to get some programs started, and also give some great examples of existing programs and how we can use those as a model to start our own programs. Just a quick overview of the agenda, uh, what we'll be talking about. Again, um, a quick overview of the, sort of the context of the existing uh, language programs landscape in the U.S. We'll be reviewing some resources provided by the Institut Comoinche, how to get a program started in your local school district, and then some successful programs at the high school and college levels um, in both Tulare and San Jose, California. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Antonio Oliveira to give us an overview of the Portuguese language programs in the U.S. So, Antonio, over to you. Thank you, and uh, welcome everybody. Muito obrigado a todos. Uh, my name is Antonio Oliveira. I'm the deputy coordinator for the education programs in the U.S. I work for Instituto Camões from Portugal. Uh, Camões Institute is a public institute which is part of the indirect government administration and endowed with administrative and financial autonomy as well as its own assets pursuing the aims of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the domains of culture and uh, education. Uh, can you advance the slides? Uh, Uh, as you know, I, I don't know, Angela, if this is the right slide. Uh, uh, yeah, we were just going to go over the importance of uh, Portuguese language learning, and then we can get into Institut Camões. Okay, okay. Uh, as uh, you know, Portuguese is uh, the eighth most spoken language in the world. It's the official language of eight countries, and um, has more than uh, 231 million people speaking uh, all over the world, uh, according to a new study published recently in Portugal by uh, Instituto Superior de Ciências do Trabalho e de Empresas, uh, they estimate that uh, more than 250 million native Portuguese speakers uh, in, in the world and they, uh, in this number, they don't count the Portuguese communities all over the world. So it's maybe more than four, four fifty millions more. Uh, and uh, uh, the economic revel relevance of the Portuguese language nowadays is well known. For example. Uh, the all Portuguese speakers in the world represents 3.6 percent of the world population. That means 3.85 percent of the world GNP. So this is a, a very important number uh, in terms of uh, economic relevance. Portuguese language is considered a language with a well, what they call a web effect. It's because it's one of the second language more used in the world of communications or in the social media. And this opens uh, more opportunities for the 
Portuguese uh, speaking uh, all over the world. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? In the United States, uh, the Instituto Camões is the the part of the Portuguese government that uh, supervise the por Portuguese teaching in the elementary schools. Uh, that's why we call the Portuguese Portuguese heritage schools or uh, community schools. These uh, uh, schools uh, uh, belong to the churches, to the Portuguese associations, and some are private schools. We count more than 60. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, give some aid to the public programs in the high schools, uh, more than 50 now in all over the country as uh, Portuguese programs. And uh, in the other level of the education system, in the at college level, we have uh, teachers and uh, lectureships in more than 75 college or uh, universities. Can you advance the slide? Another one. The mission of the Instituto is planning and implementing the policy of dissemination and teaching of the Portuguese language and culture uh, abroad and promoting the Portuguese as a language of international communication. Uh, it's not only the Portuguese uh, language that we are interested in. We are interested in promoting the, the Portuguese culture too. So uh, we have cultural events that we sponsor in the United States all over the, the Portuguese communities. Uh, for example, uh, the, the Boston Portuguese Festival is one main event that uh, bring the Portuguese culture to the state of Massachusetts. It's an important, an important event that is sponsored by the Camus Institute and another uh, cultural events uh, in uh, institutes, uh, universities, and so on. Can we advance the slide? Uh, in this year, we are uh, trying to bring to the United States uh, for the first time the certification of the Portuguese schools, the community schools. So we are uh, implement an ISAM uh, that gives uh, a certificate in Portuguese. This ISAM will be taking place on the June the 15th and this is the first time that uh, Camões uh, is doing this on the, in, in the United States. This ISAM is uh, recognized all over the world since it's uh, uh, done according to the European, European standards of uh, the teaching of foreign languages. Next slide. Uh, another important uh, mission of the Institute Camões is the training of the teachers. We offer training uh, for uh, teachers and uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, 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 teachers can uh, go to our website. It is www.instituto-camões.pt. We offer training online uh, and uh, uh, on location. For example, in the state of California, uh, Camões has a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Association of Portuguese Teachers, uh, APEUC, and uh, this year they did two uh, sessions uh, that uh, are attended by the Portuguese teachers. Uh, from the state of California. Next uh, month, May, we have uh, another section in the East Coast, in uh, Newark and Boston area. Uh, next slide. To give you uh, an idea uh, of the, this important uh, web that the uh, Instituto Camões has all over the world, we have uh, Portuguese centers 
Kamaji centers, uh, that's why how we call it, in more than 75 countries with uh, lectureships or uh, memorandums of understanding with uh, universities. To be specific, more than 290 all over the world and uh, with the international organizations too. Next slide. Uh, we offered scholarships uh, for students or uh, teachers that want to pursue uh, their education in Portugal or in the Portuguese language. Uh, we offer uh, Portuguese language centers, for example, in Boston, in uh, Rhode Island, in uh, Newark, uh, Berkeley, uh, Santa Barbara, uh, and so on. So we, another important mission of the Institute is the cooperation with the Portuguese speaking countries. Uh, as you know, the Portuguese is the, the official language of eight countries, but uh, uh, so we have a, a a very tight relationship with these countries. That's why in these Camões centers, uh, the teaching of the Portuguese is uh, uh, tied with the, the culture of these countries, the traditions and the, uh, of these speaking countries, the especially African countries uh, in Europe and here uh, with, uh, of course, Brazil. Next slide. In the United States, we have uh, two uh, memorandums and protocols of an, uh, memorandums of understanding and protocols with uh, public uh, school districts, uh, and uh, some states in uh, Massachusetts, for example, and uh, in uh, New Jersey. In uh, New Jersey and New York, we have uh, memorandums of understanding with the, the school districts of uh, Newark, Elizabeth, Mignola and uh, we are working with uh, another uh, areas and we recently uh, had another state, Florida, that is a state where the Portuguese community is growing. We have a memorandum with the uh, Miami Dade Kant uh, and uh, it's amazing but we have more than 5,000 students there uh, learning Portuguese right now. Of course, most of them are from Brazilian descent, but uh, they are learning the Portuguese language. Next slide. Uh, another important uh, mission is uh, the distribution of uh, books, uh, student books and uh, other education materials. This year we uh, provided uh, all the community schools all over the, the states with the books specifically designed for teaching the Portuguese as a foreign or second language. Uh, next slide. We can help you uh, develop a program, a Portuguese program in your community. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, we can provide the curriculum assistance, we can provide books, we can provide planning, uh, and so on. Uh, we uh, have a, a specially designed uh, design curriculum uh, from uh, K to 9 uh, and um, like I told you, we can offer you books and other materials uh, to teach Portuguese as the, in the European version. Uh, of course, uh, this is, uh, we, we, we can offer you another materials like uh, promotional uh, uh, brochures and uh, videos and uh, uh, audio uh, materials. So if you want to contact us, uh, next slide please. Next slide. Yeah, oh. You should see the contact information now. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, the coordination for the education, Portuguese education programs in the United States 
are located in uh, two areas, uh, in New York and in uh, Boston. Uh, my office is in the Portuguese consulate in New York. We have uh, I see, I'm not seeing this slide. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you have the number is uh, on your screen two one two 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 one three four six one, and the email. Uh, and uh, in New England, you can contact my colleague John Caixinha. That's the number there, 617-536-8740, and the email address. Angela, I think that's all. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, no. The questions are already starting to come in. Um, but just wanted to make sure everybody understands we're going to save the questions for the end of the webinar just so we can get through all the slides. But we, do, we are receiving your questions, so thank you. So now we're going to have Elmano Costa from uh, Turlock, California, talk about starting a Portuguese program in your local school. So Elmano, over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure most of you are, who are tuned in are probably living in the U.S., so it is still morning even in the East Coast. I um, come at this uh, from a uh, community perspective of how do we as a community organize ourselves, uh, what do we do, uh, to convince the school uh, authorities that indeed uh, Portuguese is a worthy language and should be included in the offers of, la of languages offered by different schools. I uh, have to tell you, I also come at this from the perspective as the uh, president of the Portuguese American, of the board of directors of the Portuguese American Citizenship Project. And uh, if you live in a community where the project has been working, and we do work in five states, um, we, uh, our, big, our goal, our mission is to get Portuguese Americans to vote and to vote with a lot of frequency so that uh, we do have some uh, weight when it comes to the decisions that are made by our elected officials. Uh, go ahead and advance to the next slide, Angela. Uh, one of the things that I think um, is fair to say is uh, by and large schools are not going to start a Portuguese program until there's a group of people who uh, approach the school and basically show that there's a community interest in teaching Portuguese. So it is uh, you can't just sit at home and say, why don't the school officials offer Portuguese? Can't they uh, see that there's a large interest or that there's an economic reason or all the different reasons that Antonio mentioned? Uh, basically, uh, schools tend to be status quo type of organizations. And until the community rises up a little bit and, and calls their attention, they don't react. So what I would suggest is if you are in a community where you would like to see Portuguese in the schools, the first thing I think you're going to have to do is get together a group of people. And I, I don't believe you need a large group. I think five people. In fact, uh, Margaret uh, Mead, an anthropologist, said many years ago, never doubt that a small group of people can change society that in fact that's the only time it has changed is when there's been a determined group. So if you can get five people, five, six, ten people, but you five is, is actually enough who are, can form a committee and they're willing to work hard and they're not going to just drop out and, and not be counted on, but five people who are really stay with it people, organized kind of people. I think the first thing you're going to have to do is a survey of your community. How many people do you think, how many parents are willing to say, yes, I would encourage my child to study Portuguese if it was offered at our local high school? How many uh, you know, kids would uh, be willing to put their names down and say, hey, if they offered Portuguese next year, I would sign up for Portuguese? Uh, so you need to, uh, to do that. The, um, the other thing that you need to do is sometimes schools will say, yeah, no, that's wonderful. We would like to have Portuguese. We know you've got a lot of people who would like to study it, but we don't have anyone who can teach Portuguese. And it's really surprising because I have found that in most communities where there is a, a large resident Portuguese population, there's probably already teachers working in that school district who would be capable of teaching Portuguese, who could easily obtain the, the right license or the right credential uh, in order to be able to teach. So can you come up with, 
one, two, three names of teachers who, or other key people, maybe they're not teachers, but maybe they're administrators in the district, maybe they're, you know, people really involved in the district who could be supporters of this, but particularly people who could teach. And then what I would suggest is you gather up a report, nothing large, maybe three to five pages, uh, just uh, saying, okay, here's what we've done, here's our survey results, here's the people in your district, and here's what we are asking from the district. Once you have that prepared, then I would ask for a, a meeting with the principal. And I want to stress here, I think it is important that you work your way up through the system, that you start uh, at the lowest level, and the lowest level is, is your high school principal. Uh, schedule a meeting, uh, bring your committee with you, and, uh, and then meet with the principal. Chances are, and in fact I will tell you uh, what typically happens is they will listen politely, nod their head, and basically they expect you to go away, and they expect that nothing will happen after that, because a lot of parents come to school administrators with requests, and then they leave and, and they, they never follow up and so the school system is quite used to listening and uh, waiting for you to leave and then not doing anything. So I would ask to meet with the principal. I would try to work kind of a, a timeline, say, okay, when can you have an answer for us? Can we expect an answer in two weeks or three weeks? And then, you know, if you don't get an answer, ask for another meeting and say, okay, we're back. We'd like to know what the results of, uh, of this particular uh, uh, request that we've made. Uh, chances are the principal is going to say, oh, we can't afford it, we don't have the people, we're not sure there's the enough students, all of those particular reasons. If you get a no, uh, don't get mad, just politely say thank you and, uh, and say, well, we would, we're going to contact the superintendent and we would like to meet uh, with the superintendent and then do so. Schedule a meeting with the superintendent Again, the same thing, the superintendent will listen politely and expect you to go away and nothing to happen. So it is important after you meet with the superintendent to say, okay, when can we expect an answer? And then a couple of weeks later, you contact him again and say, we would like to know what your answer is. Uh, if the superintendent again says no, then the next level is, to, is just tell the superintendent, then we would like to be put on the board agenda. We would like to address the board at the next meeting and at the next meeting, uh, go forth and address the board. Next slide, please, Angela. So again, if you go to the meeting, I would say you don't have to take a huge crowd. Uh, if you take four to six people, I think that in itself convinces most boards that there's a serious group. If you can take more, wonderful. I think the important thing is when you address a board meeting, sometimes what we see in the news, is a lot of people making a lot of noise. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. I think what's important is to be polite, but be firm. You know, uh, have a designated spokesperson so that there aren't people shouting and yelling and saying different things. Just have a spokesperson who will speak for the group. Uh, the spokesperson can go up there, introduce all the, the people in the committee. It is actually impressive if you can say, you know, uh, John uh, is on our committee, and John happens to own this business down the road, and Mary is on our committee, and Mary happens to be very involved in our church, and she's on the board in the church, and she has a lot of contact. And you could just go down and introduce the different people. You uh, present a copy of the report to, uh, to the board president, and then you share, because the reality is you can present the report. I don't think a lot of people will read a lot of the reports unless they have a reason to do so. So you just share some of the highlights. You don't read the whole report, but just share. Here's the key points in our report. We did this survey. We show that there's this many people. We looked at faculty. We know there are three people qualified in our district to teach Portuguese. And so here's what we're requesting. We would like to see Portuguese started at high school number one or whatever high school you're asking for. Uh, when you're done, thank them for their time, ask them if you can answer any questions, and then, you know, ask them the same thing. When can we expect an answer from you? Uh, because it is important to give them that kind of, of timeline. And, um, and then, again, come back and say, okay, if, if you haven't heard, I will want to know your answer. Now, let's assume, and it's quite safe to assume, 
that the school board's going to come back with an answer of, well, we really can't do it. And again, the excuses are always no money, no this, no that, no whatever it is. And this is where I think the next step comes in if need be. And the next step sometimes is that you need to actually get involved in the political process. If the people on the board say we can't do it, then it's time for you to work at getting new members on the board. I can tell you, for ex and as an example, Santa Clara, California. I think they're, they're an exemplary community uh, because Santa Clara, before each election, holds what they call a candidate's forum, or you could call it a candidate's night. They invite all candidates uh, who are running for the school board to come to the Portuguese Hall, the SES Hall in Santa Clara. And as a consequence, you know, they have a set of questions. Usually, you can only do about two or three questions, and just the night's long. They ask the question, everybody on the board gets to answer. And uh, one of the questions, and I've been to one of their nights, one of the questions always is, if elected to the school board, would you support the teaching of Portuguese at Santa Clara High School? Well, the night that I attended, of course, every single person said, many of them said, well, if we can afford it, if we can find the qualified people, yes, of course, we will. Now, they, you know, as you know, in school boards, not all members are elected the same year. It's usually half at each time. So they've done this one time. This next election cycle, they're going to do it again, which will catch the other half of the board. And now they've got people on record uh, saying, hey, if elected, I will support the teaching of Portuguese. In fact, one of the things that they also do is they videotape their, uh, their, board, their candidates' nights, and then they actually write a letter that says, thank you for coming, and, uh, and, on this, and you said, if, when we ask you this question, you said that if elected, you would indeed support the teaching of Portuguese, so we're looking forward to working with you in, uh, in you know, implementing this program. And so uh, then what it also allows you to do is a year later, six months later, you can schedule an appointment with that board member. You can say, you made this, uh, this public statement at our candidates' night, so we'd like to know what the progress is, what you've been able to do since you've been elected. And so I think before long, Santa Clara will be the next community where Portuguese will be offered because, you know, they've been very proactive and they've gotten uh, people uh, very involved. I'm sorry, Andrew, should have, I should have gone to the next slide, but I forgot to ask you. So um, if, um, if you indeed are interested in doing this, the Portuguese American Citizenship Project has a handbook uh, entitled Starting Portuguese Classes in Your Local School. You can find it at the website that's uh, listed there toward the bottom of uh, this slide. Uh, it sometimes uh, may even have to get a little bit more involved, like trying to get all the Portu local Portuguese clubs behind this effort. Uh, there are many things that the Portuguese American Citizenship Project can help you with, such as uh, sending reminders to all the voters in your community who are of Portuguese surname to get them to go out and vote. And so I won't get into a lot of details here, but I will tell you that we are available. Uh, you can certainly contact us. You can uh, call me or email me, and we will be glad to work with you on anything that you may need. And Angela, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Great. Thank you so much, Armano. Um, so we now will have Denise Borges give a case study of the Portuguese language teaching program in Tulare, Cal uh, California high schools. So Denise, over to you. Thank you, Angela. Good morning, everyone. Happy 25 de Abril, 25th of April, Liberty Day in Portugal. Uh, I would like to thank Angela for this opportunity and the PALCAS organization and obviously the sponsors, uh, the North American Portuguese Teachers Association, APILP, and also the Luso American Education Foundation. We have uh, the president here uh, with us, also on the panel, José Luis da Silva. Um, the next slide, please, Angela. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we do here in this small community, uh, just to let you know that uh, Tulare is a very small community. Probably most people have never heard of this city. <laughs> this is all to be in the central southern part of the San Joaquin Valley in California. We have a population of around 65,000 people. 
uh, and uh, our school district has three high schools, which serves this population of the city of 65,000 plus another 20,000 from a little surrounding communities, villages, etc. Portuguese classes began in 1975. Um, it was uh, actually the Portuguese classes began by our superintendent at the time. Uh, his name or principal before he became superintendent was principal of one of the high schools, the uh, first high school in the city, Tulare Union High School, which is uh, now in its 122nd year of teaching. And Dr. Ned Curley began this program at the time, like I said, he was a principal in 1975. He felt that there were quite a few Portuguese Americans in this area, and wouldn't these people like to preserve the language by having the language being taught at their high school where their kids attended, or where some of the immigrant children who were coming also might want to continue with the language, because many of them knew the language from home but did not know how to read or write the language at that time. Our high school district had two high schools and we offered Spanish, French, uh, German, and Latin. Uh, Portuguese began and sadly, uh, Portuguese sadly in one aspect, but uh, good news in, in the other, uh, Portuguese has continued. We are just about to celebrate our 40th year of teaching Portuguese at Tulare High Schools. And um, we began, um, uh, but the other languages, unfortunately, uh, have disappeared. We no longer teach French, we no longer teach uh, Latin, and we no longer teach German. So we only teach two languages, which is uh, Portuguese and Spanish. But that is kind of where California, anyway, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, depends on your perspective, uh, is going. Uh, most high schools in California are going towards just having two or at the maximum three languages. And so uh, we have been fortunate that the Portuguese program has been growing. Uh, in the first few years, the Portuguese program was taught by a lady with Brazilian background. Uh, there wasn't a lot of tie-in with the community, but she did an excellent job and continued with the courses. Um, now we have the courses are taught by uh, people who have more of a European uh, Portuguese background. Next slide, please. Um, we, uh, we began offering, so we've offered Portuguese one, two, three, uh, all for the first 20 years of the program. And basically, since 1998, we have been now offering Portuguese one, two, three, and four, and four became an honors class. And this course deals with language and with culture. And that's why you see the dancers there. Uh, there is a folkloric component to the cultural part of the course that is taught within the course. Um, the students and the parents understand this. The school board is uh, very supportive, and so is administration. And so as part of Portuguese 4, a class that in 1998 had nine students, uh, and this year, this school year of 2013, or 2012-2013, uh, has a total of 44 students. Part of it is because the students do enjoy learning that component of uh, the popular Azorean and mainland Portugal dances. And this ties in the students to the community we have throughout the school year from August until uh, the following June. We have multiple presentations that are done uh, not just at community venues, uh, Portuguese American community venues, but also citywide venues. Uh, uh, schools. We perform these dances at the uh, elementary schools when they have cultural days. We perform them at also the junior highs when they have cultural events. We perform them at multi-ethnic uh, festivals, etc., county fairs, and all of this. And this is a way to tie in. It's part of our standards for teaching foreign language in California and throughout the United States through our five C's. And one of those C's is culture. Culture and connections and community is actually those are three of the five C's. And by having this, this component of the folkloric dances within the class, which means that the students have to work extra hard in the time that's allowed for academics, but they're willing to do that, to have this component. And it uh, also allows us to touch on culture, obviously, to touch on uh, connections, OK? making connections with the different communities, and obviously the community connection of being out there, not just in the Portuguese American community, but also in the community at large. Next slide, please. Um, take a little bit of time. Um, 
just about our program, as uh, Angela said, is a case study. Uh, and if you get bored, listen to me. You can always look at the pictures of the young people. Uh, and they, um, we have three high schools. Um, uh, there's always been in the 1970s and 80s and even the beginning of the 90s an average of about 120 to 150 students uh, taking uh, the courses. This year we have 405 students this school year and we've already got the registration for the next school year and the next school year from all well, that we have we have about 428 students so there's been a continuous growth in this. Um, this growth can be attributed to many, many factors. Obviously, it's not just one factor. Um, but um, we believe, from looking at this growth, that part of it has to do, of course, with teaching uh, the teaching approach, a communicative-based approach where students are not just sitting doing a worksheet. That's a thing of the past. And hopefully, that's a thing of the past in all language classes all over in the world, not just in uh, California. Um, there's lots of hands-on learning. There's lots of cultural activities, like I mentioned, tie in to the local community um, and promoting uh, an amalgam of activities throughout the year that's important, having uh, uh, events throughout the year that bring the community to the school and the language to the community. Next slide, please. Um, we also, because of the programs at Tulare Union High School, Tulare Western High School, and Mission Oak High School, those are three high schools in our district. One of the growth factors has been because of the Hispanic community. We have a very large Hispanic community in this uh, city. Uh, our population, our student population at the uh, all three high schools is 62 percent Hispanic. So it is a rather large Hispanic community. And right now at two of our three high schools, over 45 percent of the students taking Portuguese are Hispanic. So our program has been growing not just because of Portuguese Americans. Unfortunately, there are many, and I have the numbers for this year. There are people with Portuguese last names. There are many, about uh, 85 students to be exact, who are not taking Portuguese, who are taking Spanish. Mm, the majority do take Portuguese, but quite a few must take Spanish. And our growth factor has been because of the Hispanic community. The Hispanic uh, kids who are immigrants are who are first born here but who have a command of the Spanish language are really interested in learning a third language. They are fascinated by Brazil uh, as part of their world, of the Latin American world, of the, of the South American culture, Central and South American cultures. And so um, they really can get into the uh, language. It's uh, kind of easy for them to learn a third language, especially going from Spanish to Portuguese or, as most of you know, vice versa. We also have a student organization on campus uh, called SOPUSH, which uh, can be tied into those who know a little bit about Azorian culture with the Holy Ghost Festus. And uh, we use that uh, because it's a popular uh, name, popular acronym, and we have used it as our Society of Portuguese American Students. This is extracurricular activities that are done. These activities are done usually at noontime with meetings and promotion of the cultural aspect of the language and also after school. I believe uh, vehemently that um, not just what you do in the classroom is important. It is important, very important. But what can be done with the students uh, throughout extracurricular activities, whether it be on campus with the rest of the student population or whether it be uh, it, with the community itself. I believe it's very, very important for the language to be visible in the community itself. I'm not just talking about the Portuguese American community. That's important for that tie-in, and that's been our toughest um, uh, 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 toughest way to, to get to, actually. It's been our toughest nut to crack, uh, pardon the popular expression. But it has been because there's been um, kind of a barrier that's been established throughout the years that in the Portuguese American community that people stay out of school. Uh, fortunately, the younger generations now, the first, second, and third generations born in the United States, have a different outtake on that, uh, have a different opinion. They are involved, and thank God, with their kids in school. And so I believe that uh, they have a different aspect, and that's helped us tremendously. So it's not just getting the community involved, the Portuguese American community, in your school program but it's also getting the school program involved in the other ethnic communities that compose our mosaic. 
Um, and we have students in our SOPA it's Society of Portuguese American Students, but it's open to all students. We have, you know, we have students who are of different uh, ethnicities who are part not just of the club, but also of our officer group. Next slide, please. And so um, the, um, the, what is important, as I mentioned, uh, for I believe a successful program at a high school level is indeed to have the buy-in, is indeed to have the different cultural activities throughout the school year. Um, it is to get the students involved and make the language a hands-on language and a language that can be useful to them, not just you know speaking to their grandparents, for those who are Portuguese-American background, and, but most importantly as a world language like it was mentioned earlier by our colleague and friend Antonio Oliveira. So that's basically what I wanted to talk about. I believe that there is an amalgam of uh, things that uh, are important to uh, making a language uh, program a success in any high school. We feel ours is a success, a success not only because of the numbers, uh, but also because the students, most students obviously, uh, do enjoy the classes uh, and the program has been going because of that. One thing that I would like to add, if I'm permitted, um, and that is that one of the issues that all of our organizations uh, need to kind of get in, in back on track, uh, because this was a movement about a half a dozen years ago, but it has died, is uh, trying to get Portu an AP exam, not a SAT, not a SAT, but a Portuguese exam, an AP exam in Portuguese language. If that would be, uh, that should be an ultimate goal for all those who are interested in the teaching of the Portuguese language at a secondary level uh, in our public and private high schools throughout the United States of America and throughout Canada also. Um, but in this case, throughout the United States of America, our college board needs to be made aware of the importance of putting a Portuguese AP exam. This uh, gives us uh, lots of uh, opportunities. Um, and it would put the language on par with the other languages, with languages such as Korean that has an AP exam. And many of the languages that are spoken by less and less people than the Portuguese language with almost 250 million speakers. I think this is something that we have never gotten involved, the entire community. I know Palkus has done a good job trying to get the community involved. I know other organizations have also, but I believe that it could be um, a saving grace, let's put it this way, for many of the Portuguese language programs in California in the United States in general, and it would be a way also as another card to have when thinking about starting a, a Portuguese language program in, in your school district if you are, if that is the case. And as a case in point, we have the next Portuguese program to start here in California, uh, if everything goes right, will be next uh, fall in August of this year. Uh, Hanford High School, Hanford is a community next to ours of about 50,000 people, um, a large Portuguese American community is there also. They had Portuguese many years ago. They have not had Portuguese in the last 20 years. And we have a principal at one of the high schools who is uh, married to a Portuguese American. Uh, she was actually an administrator at our school district and I've been working and we have been working with her. And um, she has already signed up 64 students, so enough for two classes of Portuguese one. Uh, we're working on getting a teacher right now and qualified for it. And uh, so here is an example here. That one of the first things that we were asked when I put together the course outlines for the administration at Hanford is, is there an AP test offered in Portuguese? Because that's important, because that gives the students an opportunity to obviously do an AP class their fourth year. If they pass the exam with three or better, then they can get three college units. And the uh, parents are looking more and more into those possibilities with the cost of college on the rise. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, so we have a, a couple of minutes to uh, have Jose Luis talk a little bit about the program in San Jose. I know, Jose, uh, you don't have any slides, but if you'd like to say a few words about the San Jose program, um, go ahead. Uh, um, my name is Jose Luis Silva, and I, I retired from uh, teaching in the Portuguese program at San Jose High about three years ago. And uh, San Jose High uh, Portuguese program has some similarities and some differences from the program in Pulare. Um, mostly the difference is because of the situation that uh, San Jose is in urban, urban center, like in the middle of Silicon Valley, big city. And uh, so the population
population uh, and, and services are a little different, but many things are, are, are common. The program at Center has started in the early 70s, uh, following the big uh, Portuguese immigration wave of, of the time. And um, um, the Portuguese community is situated around the five minutes church, and uh, people got together. Uh, following what our mother said before about the couple of the nines, uh, uh, in the program, it was really a small group of, of professionals, uh, very determined, including a lawyer that was well oiled in the community and uh, used to play uh, golf with the mayor of San Jose, so that, that helped. And they pressured and were able to, to accomplish um, uh, the establishment of three Portuguese programs uh, one at the elementary school, one at the middle school, and one at Sensor High. The elementary uh, school was a bilingual program, the middle school was a bilingual and a home maintenance. Uh, home language maintenance. It says that high the time uh, in the 70s was a home language maintenance program. In the early 80s, uh, they added the bilingual program, uh, and in the late 80s, um, that was discontinued and uh, continued to be the language uh, language maintenance program. The school at the time in the 80s became an international glory program for school, and uh, that uh, that uh, program uh, gives, among other things, uh, accreditation to college. Uh, and, uh, and international uh, international presentation. Um, uh, I, sorry, I'm going to cut some of the things I have to say. Um, Portuguese became one of the subjects in the International Baccalaureate or IB program in San Jose High. And uh, the, the program at the time was serving mostly Portuguese and loser American students, but had some non-Portuguese general students who had participated in the elementary or middle school program. In the late 90s, Program questions itself that students without formal knowledge of Portuguese while serving the needs of the Portuguese American population. The result from that the exams were excellent. Only in all those years, only three or four students did not uh, pass this rigorous exam, written an oral uh, exam, which is uh, uh, actually monitored by uh, uh, by, by the by the international organization. Um, with uh, with the new millennium, uh, the Portuguese population was moving away from the the, the five room church area, the urban center of the Portuguese population of San Jose, and, and going towards the surrounding areas, uh, which belong to other school districts. San Jose has several school districts, each one of them with, with uh, several high schools. So as they moved across a, a particular street, they could no longer come to our school. So we had to change to survive, and uh, the program had to lean more towards the non Portuguese population. Um, one of the things that became even more important at that time was the Portuguese club. I know that the Mies mentioned uh, his uh, Portuguese club. We also uh, worked very hard with that. A uh, very active club with folk dancing group, fundraising, and we actually have, uh, for 16 years now, there's been a, a senior scholarship dinner. And one year, one year they were able to raise up to $16,000 to give the scholarship to all students who were members of the club taking Portuguese at all. That really helped uh, bring in the students into the into into the classes. Um, the, the enrollment um, uh, increased with the, the different kinds of, of ethnicity uh, kids that came in. Uh, Sanjay High is over seventy five percent Hispanic, so we try to attract uh, these kind of kids with the same ideas that uh, we was 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 talking about. Uh, one of the things that they really uh, they enjoy Portuguese because it's it's similar to Spanish. They understand it. And uh, it's 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 it's, it's, it's uh, sexy to them because it's, it's kind of different. So they really enjoy that. A lot of it has to do with activities in the classroom, as we stated previously. Um, the enrollment increased in Portuguese uh, at the time. Uh, at the same time, for French, um, French, Portuguese, and Spanish were the three languages taught. French uh, program was eliminated, and at, at present, only Portuguese and Spanish uh, exist. Uh, when I retired three years ago, uh, there were. Uh, Two hundred students who take classes. Presently, the program continues in the same in the same manner. There are six classes in Portuguese at Sanjay High: uh, two for first year, two for second year, one for third year, and one uh, for IB Portuguese. So, um, uh, basically, and very quickly, that's uh, what the program is. Uh, with, uh, with, as I mentioned, with similarities with Larry and and uh, some of the differences because of, of, of the structure of the community in Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Luis. Uh, before we get to questions, we just have a couple of slides here that we wanted to share with everybody. Um, some resources that you can look to online to uh, 
get information about uh, curriculum and other online courses and other resources that are available. This PowerPoint presentation will be made available um, on the Talkus uh, Facebook page, so you will be able to download it and go through it at your leisure. Um, but I just wanted to, to highlight these. Um, oops, uh, we have some feedback happening, but I um, uh, just wanted to uh, highlight some of these resources that are available to you. Um, so let's move on to, oops, we missed the questions. Uh, so we'll do the first question. Let's do the first question, which is, I work at a four-year institution in New Jersey where Portuguese is not yet offered. I'm interested in bringing Portuguese here in an offering study abroad opportunities to Portugal. Where can I find grant opportunities to make this happen? Um, Antonio, do you want to take this one from the institute? Uh, Angela, I, I cannot hear you very well. There's uh, some background noise that is uh, Yes, I'm my... wondering if uh, one of our panelists... Uh, is there a reason? Do you have a mute button? I'm wondering if it's your, your phone or where is quite a bit of feedback. Can everybody else? Uh, so essentially, Antonio, they're asking about grant information for programs. Oh, okay. Where can they get some grant information? To, to study in Portugal? Uh, no, to establish a Portuguese program at a four-year institution, so at the college level. Um, well, uh, Camus, as I mentioned, we have uh, a lot of uh, memorandums of understanding signed with uh, uh, some college and universities all over the, the states. So in order for us to uh, try to help you, we have to contact us and uh, we can discuss that further. The, I can tell you that uh, some kind of uh, aid to establish a, a Portuguese program uh, could uh, include um, Paying for a teacher, a visiting, visiting teacher, uh, gives uh, an amount of money to during uh, uh, one or two or three years to uh, uh, trying to establish the program, furnish uh, books and other educational materials. But uh, like I mentioned, we have to contact our office in, in the Portuguese consulate in New York and we can discuss that further. Angel? Angel, it's dead. Angel? Angel, are you there? Angel? El Mano, está ouvindo? I'm here, I can hear you. Nobody else. Nobody else. <laughs> yeah, there's Angela. She's back. She's back home oh. now. She's back home. Okay. I'm back. Sorry, sorry about that. As I mentioned, there's always... We thought she might have gone into labor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, it, it's the risk you take when you do a live webinar with some technical difficulties, so my, my apologies there. Um, so I, I'm guessing that question got answered. Yes, go yes. to the second question. Okay. We actually don't have any other questions at the time. Um, are there are some common questions that you all get from community members who have expressed interest in um, starting a program? Angela, you might want to, I notice there's 15 people on the list, maybe explain how they could ask a question, because that might be a question for some people. I know for me this is the first time doing a webinar, so uh, maybe a quick explanation if anyone has a question how to send it in. Sure. Um, let me get back to that slide at the very beginning that actually shows the uh, the console. So you should have a um, uh, on the right side of your screen a GoToWebinar console, and there's a, a section for chat, and you can type your message there, and then it, it comes directly to me, and I can ask the question for you. So that's how most questions can get asked. Um, so, but like I said, at the time uh, at this present time we don't have any other questions and we only have about four minutes left of the webinar anyway so it's uh, 
That's okay. Angela, just a quick comment. Sure, go ahead. Um, just uh, real quick, um, the uh, you mentioned comments from uh, from community uh, members, and I think you know, of course, Almanu and Antonio touched on this, and so is Luis. Um, I believe um, that uh, there is ample opportunity, uh, you know, um, for growth uh, in the teaching of the Portuguese language uh, in the United States, whether it be in collaboration with some areas where there is a strong or stronger uh, Brazilian community and or uh, folks from other Portuguese-speaking countries, namely from the African countries and namely from uh, Cabo Verde, Cape Verde, that uh, there is uh, there's ample opportunity for this. We have only a very limited number, as Antonio shared in the beginning of the um, of the pro of, of the webinar. So um, there's definitely room for growth, and as Zelwish mentioned, in most of these schools, we have French uh, taking a decline, a very strong decline, and this is a very very good, very very good opportunity for a language that actually is showing some growth, as the Portuguese language is, for us to introduce Portuguese uh, at the high school level. Sometimes there's been this thought that, you know, well, all we need to do is just start a Portuguese program at a local uh, university or college. But it is more than known that one of the reasons why uh, Spanish and even other languages, in this case, let's just use Spanish, is tremendously popular, not only because of the significant Hispanic community, obviously, in the United States of America, but also because students who have to continue with the language or who decide to take a language as an elective in a university setting or for general ed education are going to continue with a language that they had some access to it, whether it be an elementary or secondary level. So uh, we need to really have a bigger emphasis on uh, teaching Portuguese at a secondary level. And with the decline of French and also of the German language in programs in California and throughout the United States of America, this is really an opportunity, a once in a life, I might would say opportunity. This opportunity has been in effect for the last six to ten years, and I think it will continue for another, you know, another decade or so. But if we do not take advantage of it, there are going to be other languages that will, such as languages that are even spoken by more people as Chinese and other languages. There are regional languages, yes, but they have a lot of speakers, and there's a lot of interest in those regions. I, uh, Portuguese can all, uh, has to always be sold as a world language spoken all over the world. But there are other regional languages that are obviously very, very important. And this is the time for our leaders and those interested in the language to really promote it because I think we have another half a dozen or a dozen years and then the tide will change again. That's a really good point. Thank you, Denise. Um, we have one last question. This in the, again is for Antonio. Um, we noticed that uh, the representation for Institute Camões is uh, both offices on the East Coast. Is there plans to open up a, a representation on the West Coast? Uh, actually, we have a representation uh, on the West Coast, uh, and uh, our uh, professors de apoio, that's how we call them are uh, Denise Borges and José Luis da Silva. Both are present here on this webinar. Right. Um, so we uh, we have a Camões as a pro, uh, Memorandum of Understanding signed uh, last year with the Associação de Professores de Português and uh, Denise as a president and José Luis as a teacher are, are our representatives in the, in the state of California. So any Anything related to the Portuguese programs, uh, we can address them. Yeah, and Zell Luis is also, as Antonio mentioned, he's also the uh, vice president of our board of directors uh, exactly. of the uh, National Portuguese Teachers Association. So, between uh, both of us, we kind of uh, we we are here not to take not to do the job that Antonio does. Obviously, our job is totally different. Uh, our job is more in the uh, to try to to, cut, to to implement new programs as many as we can and to foster those that exist and to give teacher training to our teachers of the Portuguese language in California. That's great. It's good to know. Thank you very much. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. We are already one past uh, the hour. Um, thank you all of our presenters for, for attending and your time, uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules. We know that the, um, 
you have a million things going on, and so we appreciate your time. Um, this webinar will be archived, both uh, the actual video recording as well as the uh, PowerPoint presentation. You can watch it at the, our YouTube channel. And we encourage you to share them with family and friends so that um, everybody can um, take advantage of the resources shared in this webinar um, for you know many, many months, not just this one-time uh, event. Um, I want to thank, again, our sponsors for making this uh, webinar possible, the Muslim American Education Foundation and our North and North American Portuguese Teachers Association. Um, and that's it. So thank you all for, very much for attending. And uh, we hope that you will join us for our next one next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much, everybody. Have a great Happy day. Bye-bye.